Today we're going to make custom concrete pavers. I really like using concrete pavers for my patios because they're low cost and super low maintenance. So I decided to come up with a system that wouldn't just look cool for the pavers themselves, but would also have integrated planters so I could weave in vegetation into the concrete. The design starts with this pattern that I've been experimenting with for quite some time. At its most basic, it's comprised of two different diamond shapes that when combined, make these pentagons. Four of these pentagons can be combined to make a hexagon that can establish a really cool pattern in a variety of different ways. By tinting the concrete pavers different colors, I could use this one system to create an unlimited combination of designs. But we're gonna start simple with just these three basic shapes. I drew them in Illustrator, it only took about 10 minutes, and then exported them as SVG files so that I could load them up into my new robot the Shaper Origin. I'm gonna start by making MDF positive prototypes of the different pieces in the system. The Shaper Origin is a handheld CNC system that uses this domino looking tape to superimpose a digital file, in this case, the Illustrator drawings that I did, onto the work surface. Onboard cameras and a screen allow you to scan in the particular layout of the domino tape so that the machine knows exactly where it is at all times. I then import the SVG files and place the design onto this virtual workspace. And now I'm ready to cut. The machine lets me decide whether I want to cut inside the line, directly on center with the line, or outside the line. I'm using a quarter inch diameter router bit, and I'm going to cut through this three quarter inch MDF in three quarter inch deep passes. The only additional setup that I needed to do was hit one button to calibrate the Z axis and plug in a hose that is connected to my shop vac for dust collection. From here, it's basically just the world's easiest video game where you look at the screen and move the machine exactly where it tells you to go. It adjusts for your shaky hands and helps you out with autopiloting around tricky corners. And now that I think about it, I think robot is actually the wrong term. It's more like a prosthesis that makes you into sort of a woodworking cyborg where you're controlling the big movements but perfect fine motor skills are augmented by this really smart machine. Once I complete the first pass at a quarter inch deep, I then just go back over the lines, this time with the depth set to half an inch. What's really nice about this system is that you don't need to 3D model to actually cut things out in 3D. For the third and final pass, I just set the depth to just slightly over three quarters of an inch, and I made sure just to take my hand off the trigger to leave a few little tabs that will keep the pieces that I'm cutting out from floating around and jamming up the blade. I can just cut through these tabs really quickly with a Japanese pull saw or even just use a knife. I want the pavers to be two and a quarter inches thick, so I'm gonna stack three layers of the three quarter inch thick MDF and glue them together. I started with one of the solid plain pavers before gluing together these three donut shaped pentagons, which will make the base for the planter versions of the pavers. The top of the planter paver base will have a recess that allow me to stick these other planter pieces into it, almost as if it was a pentagon shaped concrete pipe. This piece is going to be five layers of MDF thick, so my squeeze clamps wouldn't work for it, so I just use finished screws and glue to fasten the rings in place. I then use some Bondo all-purpose putty to cover up the sunken screw heads. Once all the glue and Bondo had fully cured, I used my orbital sander to sand down the edges and get everything nice and smooth by sanding it to 220 grit. I want the tops of the pavers to be comfortable on bare feet, so I used a round over bit on my palm router just to give the top of the pavers about an eighth of an inch radius. I also routed along the surfaces of the pipe sections that'll serve as the planters, just so I don't get crumbly edges. In addition to the pentagons, I also made the smaller four-sided diamond shapes as well. After wiping away all the sawdust, I then sealed the paver blanks with three coats of varathane, water-based polyurethane. I did a light sanding with 320 grit sandpaper after every coat and these blanks came out real smooth. These MDF blanks are now perfect replicas of what I want the concrete to be, so I'm gonna build a mold around it so I can pour silicone on top of them. I had some leftover quarter inch thick whiteboard and I just cut that into strips with my circular saw and then hot glued the pieces with a little bit of two x four scrap backing. 
For this first mold, I used some finished screws to actually screw through the whiteboard and into the MDF blank, and then sealed around the edges with some GE silicone caulk. From here, it's just arts and crafts time with the hot glue gun, just gluing the pieces and pressing them down nice and firmly, and then reinforcing all the seams with a nice thick bead of hot glue. The plain paper was the easiest, but for the planter sections and the planter base, you have to get a little bit more intricate because you have to make an inner part to the mold as well, since that silicone is pretty expensive, and I don't want to have it just be all solid in the middle. The planter section is the thickest piece, and for this one, I tried something a little bit different. I just used hot glue to glue it down to the whiteboard. Now, my go-to reusable, flexible mold making material for concrete is Moldstar 30 from Smooth On. I've probably used this over 20 times and it's really easy. I've never had any problems with it and the molds last a really long time. I do recommend power mixing just to get a really thorough, consistent mixture. It's a one-to-one -one formula, so you don't need any special measuring equipment and it only needs a few hours to set up before you can remove it from the molds. I peeled away the majority of the hot glue and then pulled back the pieces of whiteboard so that I could get the silicone molds out. For the basic paver, the MDF blank came out real easy. For the planter section, it was a little bit more tricky and I had to cut the silicone back just a little bit. But don't worry, this stuff is really strong and rubbery and it'll close right back up when I need to pour concrete into it. The silicone is quite expensive, so I want to make the molds as thin walled as possible, but I don't want to get under half an inch thin. Any thinner than that, and I find that the concrete starts to push out a little bit too much on the molds, and your straight walls will end up a little bit curvy. I was cutting it pretty close with these molds, so just to be on the safe side, I used some scrap plywood and 2x2s to make some stop blocks that I screwed to a plywood base around the silicone molds. Is what these little pieces of wood will do, they'll just keep the silicone walls from bending out. Now I'll probably spill a little bit of concrete and water on these pieces of wood, so I made sure to coat them all with two coats of Verithane water-based polyurethane. I then screwed these down to a two layer thick plywood base right around the silicone mold themselves. I was now ready to mix and pour some concrete and I decided on using Quickcrete 5000, which is my go-to concrete mix. At 5000 PSI, it's way stronger than typical concrete, but it's readily available and quite affordable. I typically get 80 pound bags for right around five to six dollars each. I mixed the concrete until it was the consistency of lumpy oatmeal and then started scooping it into the silicone molds. I filled the molds about halfway full and used my hoe to kind of push and tap the concrete down into the corners. Now I want this to be a real smooth concrete, so I did a really good job vibrating it. Now there's a few ways you can do this. A reciprocating saw works really well. You just hit that plywood base with the tip of the blade and it'll rattle it around and really shake out the bubbles. What works even better is if you have a really heavy duty hammer drill. I just use this hammer drill in the jackhammer mode. It's a really big one from Milwaukee and it vibrated the hell out of this whole plywood platform. And I had really smooth concrete with very few bubbles. I let the concrete cure 24 hours and then just pop them right out of the mold. You don't need to use mold release with silicone like this when it's poured really smoothly. I've never had concrete stick to it in the 50 or something pours that I've done. Now, I did need to remove one of the little plywood support blocks to release the planter section's silicone mold. I also had to cut a little bit farther into the silicone to get the concrete piece out without breaking it. I then rinsed off the molds, reset them into the plywood, and mixed up the next batch of concrete and got the next set of pavers ready. It takes me about 15 minutes to mix and pour an 80 pound bag of concrete. And so I just had a little routine where I'd knock out a set of pavers every single day. Now the MDF blanks were completely unharmed during the process, so I could just make additional silicone molds and pour more pavers at once, but I was really fine with this slow and steady approach. I like that I can incrementally chip away at a big patio project 
simply by putting in 15 minutes to half an hour a day. The pavers fit together perfectly and I really like how you can use the smaller diamond shaped ones to work around trees or other obstacles without breaking up the pattern. The planters stack just like concrete pipes and I really like the way they look when I fill them up with some succulents just to test them out. Now we're still accumulating pavers by pouring more every single day, but we're gonna install all of these eventually at my sister Jessie's house that she's remodeling. Be sure to check out her channel. I'll put a link to that in the description box below. She's released a couple of videos and it's a really cool series. But for now, let's head over to the studio and talk about this design. All right, welcome to the design notes portion of the video where I'll go over some of the things I probably could have done a little bit better and talk about additional options for a project like this. Now this video was about the initial design and fabrication of the system, but we'll do a follow-up one once we've built out a few more pavers. We're shooting for around 200 square feet to be installed at my sister Jessie's house, and we'll do a video that shows how we installed that and whatever additional features that we came up with. Now for me personally, I really like this slow and steady approach. I like the fact that I can just crank out a little bit every day and never be overwhelmed with this monumental task of making all these pavers at once. But if you were going to go after a really big area, it would probably make sense to make way more of the silicone mold so you're making bigger batches at a time. That just becomes a time versus cost versus efficiency problem where you have to factor in the cost of the silicone, which isn't cheap, versus the amount of pavers that you can produce with a single mixing. You should also then consider about how much concrete you can comfortably mix at once. If you're going to use a concrete mixer like I did for a previous patio project at the container house, uh, then you could probably probably go for, I don't know, like six to eight bags at a time. But right now this system's working well. Now if I did need to make additional silicone molds, I could use those MDF blanks again. They were completely unharmed during the process so far. Another way to make the design or the process more efficient would be to cast thinner walls on the silicone. So you could use the same amount of silicone but maybe get more molds. And one of the ideas that I have that I'm working on now is actually CNCing an outer shell so that you could maybe get down to about a quarter inch, but you had a really good outer shell that completely supports all the way around it. So you're only using the silicone as the thin point of contact, sort of as a membrane between the outer shell and the concrete itself. So that's a way that you could, again, stretch your dollar a little bit farther and still make more pavers at once. Now you don't need a CNC to do this project, although it does make it a little bit more precise. You could use a circular saw on a straight edge or a track saw to create similar geometries. In my past paver projects, I've used a 3D printer and I even did one where I molded some modeling clay by hand and made a really kind of cobblestone feeling uh, positive mold and then I poured silicone right onto the modeling clay. So I'll put a link to that video in the description box below, but check it out and don't get discouraged if you don't have access to this kind of machinery at this particular moment. Now, one of the things I'm most excited about is adding additional design features to the same pattern. And obviously you could do bigger garden plots, you could work in some furniture. I've been thinking about how to work some greenhouse or cold frames into the same pattern, but let me know your ideas in the comment section below. The first one I'll probably do will be some sort of fire pit. I just think that this pattern lends itself to a central fire pit with its sort of geometry all coming to a flame in the middle. Now the cost of this project is interesting. Obviously, there's an upfront cost for the silicone and the MDF and most importantly, the shaper origin. But when you think about how efficiently it uses concrete to create surface area, that upfront cost could be offset depending how big you want to build. So don't go buy an expensive CNC machine just to make a tiny little patio. But if you're actually going to do a pretty large installation, a dedicated machine might work out. And here's why. With a single 80 pound bag, I'm able to get about three to four square feet of concrete pavers. The cost of that bag is about $6. So once you have the molds, your cost of producing pavers is pretty low, especially when you factor in how low maintenance concrete pavers are relative to wood decking. So for this 200 square foot patio, I estimate that my cost for all the materials will end up around $4 a square foot. Now, is this a practical DIY project? 
It is for me because if I was to hire someone to do this kind of concrete work, it would be extraordinarily expensive. I mean, go ahead and price out custom concrete countertops and you'll see why concrete makes so much sense as a DIY material. I think the one-off totally custom look of this project will completely justify any amount of time and probably if we were to resell the house eventually, would probably even justify the cost of the machine itself, even though we didn't use that machine just for this project. Now, as for the Shaper Pro itself, I know a lot of people are gonna be asking about my thoughts on it. They are not paying me. They did send me the machine, so shout out to Shaper. But I'm sort of torn. The technology is amazing. It works exactly the way it says it's supposed to. It's incredibly easy to use. I was operating and cutting my first piece uh, just about 40 minutes out of the box. And compared to other CNC machines I've used, that is really, really great. Now it does cost about $2,500, which is more than an X-Carve, which can do a lot of different things and you can kind of set it and forget it. But the Origin does have some advantages, meaning that you could cut out really big pieces, although it starts to get tedious as the pieces get bigger and bigger because you gotta stand there and operate it. Where I think it has a lot of value is for graphic designers or people that have some sort of 2D digital skills. Because if you're a professional graphic designer that does branding work, and maybe you're doing some freelance things here or there, if you could add physical sign making, which this machine is perfect for, you could probably pay for the machine itself with one or two commissions. So if you're already good at Illustrator, you can take all those skills in that vector-based software and apply them to a physical reality right away. And I'm just okay at Illustrator, so I'd, I'd really love to see graphic designers get one of these, and I bet you they could find a way to make money back on it. Also great for woodworkers that maybe live in cities or don't have large shops. CNC's take up a lot of room, especially if they have a big bed design. Uh, I've been using the X card for years and I'll still use it because it's awesome and probably one of the most cost effective digital fabrication options. But even the medium sized one takes up about uh, almost four by, uh, it's also very space efficient, right? So this is a really great machine for someone that maybe lives in an apartment and occasionally does maker projects or someone that has a really small shops. CNC's take up a lot of room. Even my smaller X-Carve is, takes up about a four foot by four foot footprint. So that's 16 square feet of shop space uh, for something that I don't use on a daily basis. So what I like about this is that I can cut out really big pieces, uh, do a lot of detailed work, make signs, uh, make templates for graphics, and then pack it all up into the really nice carrying case that it comes with and then store it away in a closet or cupboard. So I do recommend it if you can afford it or if you see an opportunity where it can take your business to the next level. And I think there's a lot of ROI with this type of technology in general. All right, thanks for watching. Uh, be sure to check out some of our other videos and don't forget to check out Jessie's channel because she's starting to post videos on the new house and uh, it's coming along pretty nicely. All right. Bye everyone.